I had briefly introduced about acquired immune response and it is dependent on the genetic constitution of the individual I had said but for some of the acquired immune response the genetic constitution is not very important we'll see why it is not important okay broadly you can classify acquired immune response into four different types as I have represented on the slide, one is naturally acquired passive immunity. Just split the words and try to understand. It is naturally acquired by a person without his efforts or her efforts. And it is transferred to the person passively. Means without the knowledge of the person, it is transferred. Here, the genetic constitution is not very important. It's just that the person should be accepting that immunity. It is through natural process. I'll come to that little later. Then go to the second part. The second heading states that naturally acquired active immunity. This is purely based on genetic constitution of the individual. And it is lifelong. It lasts until his death. And what he acquires is based on his capability to develop the immune response. And that also is natural. He acquires it naturally through the infection. Then the third one, artificially acquired passive immunity. Here, this immunity is given to the person to give protection. And it is through artificial means. And it gives him protection for a short duration, but does not last long in his life. It is only for a part of one month or so. After that, if the person doesn't develop his own naturally acquired active immunity, he will have to be given once again that passive immunity that is artificially acquired passive immunity. We'll deal with those, those things in detail a little later. Then comes artificially acquired active immunity this is also artificial why because it is through vaccination process we develop immunity as though we were infected but we do not develop any disease symptoms we develop active antibodies and cellular immune system and we activate our immune system as though we were naturally infected in this fourth type that is artificially acquired active immunity. First, we'll take up naturally acquired passive immunity. What does it mean? Naturally acquired passive immunity happens in an individual when the person is developing in the mother's womb. As the person is developing in the mother's womb, Mother who has developed all active immunity in her life, plus whatever immunization she had gone through during her childhood, that is, all the different types of vaccination schedules she had gone through, she will have antibodies against those vaccines of deadly bacteria and deadly viruses, and that will be actively there in her, plus. She will develop some immunity against natural infections which she goes through during her lifetime until she carries the child and all that antibodies that are developed in her in the form of IgG, immunoglobulin G, will be transferred through the placenta to the, to the developing embryo or the fetus. IgG, please remember, gets transferred from the mother passively to the fetus without the knowledge of the fetus that's how the fetus gets protected when it is developing in the mother's womb and then when the child is born first 23 days of its life whatever the IgG that was transferred by the mother will be protecting the child because IgG has a half-life of 23 days and that child will be protected against any other natural infections because it had got that passive transfer of mother's IgG into its blood 
through the placenta. And remember, mother is also immunized when she is carrying the baby. She is given a booster shot of tetanus. And she is stimulated to develop anti tetanus antibodies. Why? Because when the child is born, the child will be exposed to tetanus bacteria, which is there in the environment, plus the child's umbilical cord when it is cut, the child will get infected. For that reason, mother is going to be immunized against tetanus and she will have very high titer IgG in, his, in her blood that will be transferred to the fetus and fetus is protected against tetanus. Of course, mother is immunized against diphtheria, mother is immunized against polio. All those antibodies which are there in her will be transferred to the child in the form of IgG passively without the fetus knowledge. The second important thing is after the fetus is born, it is always said that mother has to give her first milk to the child. And that first milk is referred as colostrum. And that colostrum is very thick milk containing all antibodies which are called as secretory IgA, immunoglobulin A. And these antibodies are also working against all pathogens because the mother has developed them during her acquired immune response. And this IgA, which is transferred into the fetus, in its gastrointestinal tract, it is directly absorbed by the intestinal surface and gets into the blood circulation and gives protection to the child, not only in the gastrointestinal lining, but also it gives protection to the child in the blood. The secretory IgA molecule is not going to be digested by digestive enzymes because it is protected by a special protein chain called a secretory chain, which we'll discuss when we are going to talk about IgA molecule in detail in unit three. But for the time being, you keep in mind two antibodies, that is IgG through the placenta and IgA through the mother's milk transferred to the child, gives protection to the child when it is born in this environment. Therefore, it is always said that mother's immune response should be good enough and she should not have malnourishment. Malnourishment, malnutrition impairs the immune response. That is why infant mortality in India is very high because the mothers who are malnourished when they give birth to the child, neither they will have produced good milk to feed to the child, nor they have good immune response. They are malnourished by themselves. That is the reason when the child doesn't get initial protection from the mother passively, the child may succumb to any kind of pathogenic bacterial infection and die at an early, early life itself. Therefore, it is very important that the immune response of the mother should be good enough and she should have been producing the antibodies actively. Her nourishment should be good, so she gives protection to the child. And then the child has to be fed on mother's milk, not only the first milk, continuously for the next nine months of its growth. When the mother is feeding the milk to the child next nine months, she is continuously giving protection through secretory IgA through her milk. That is why. Mothers milk fed children have good amount of protection against almost all infections and they develop very fast and they are they grow very well and they do not succumb to any kind of infections because they are protected and this immune response is in fact doesn't produce memory and it is short lived and it is there as long as the IgG has the very short half life of 23 days. After that, there is no IgG going to be transferred to through the mother's milk. Whatever is going to be transferred is only through the mother's milk is IgA and the protection comes from secretary IgA. And once the mother's milk feeding is stopped, the child has to develop its own immune system 
by nine month or so child's bone marrow would have got activated by getting exposure to the natural pathogens and it will start developing the immune response and child will start developing acquired immune response on its own meantime the child also goes through the artificial artificial acquired active immunity she the child is going to be vaccinated against different pathogens which we'll talk about that little later and when the child is given immunization through vaccination the child will develop the acquired immune response against those pathogens so first few months of the life of the child is dependent on the mother naturally through transfer of passive immunity from the mother then we'll go to the next that is naturally acquired active immunity this happens in all individuals moment the individual is born in this environment depending on his genetic constitution the acquired immune response responds the title or the threshold of the acquired immune response is dependent on the genetic constitution first there are pathogenic bacteria which are highly toxic like tetanus which kills the person within 48 hours after the infection similarly diphtheria which causes whooping cough and it is highly toxic because it produces diphtheria toxin similarly tetanus also produces tetanus toxin similarly there is a botulinum bacteria which produces botulinum toxin these toxins are deadly and when they make their presence in the blood of an individual through infection they do not allow the person to survive therefore one cannot expect to develop natural immunity against deadly bacteria therefore one need to be protected against these pathogenic bacteria through passive means in the beginning then artificial means later artificially acquired ac active immunity should be developed against them through vaccination schedule otherwise in the early life the person has to be protected through passive means that happens through the mother so remaining other bacteria or viruses we go through the infections and those infections are subclinical they are not deadly they do they are not detrimental and an individual goes through the infection cycle say for example within one week's time he will develop the cellular immunity that is t cell immunity and he will develop the acquired immune response in the form of antibody production so after one week the antibodies start making its presence for all subclinical infection and the individual recovers from the infection within 15 days and that recovery is because his immune system has responded and the antigen in the form of virus or the bacteria that had entered the body has been tackled and slowly that antigen is going to be removed from his body or her body and antibody title goes very high and then it comes down after a month the person recovers that is why it is always said that for subclinical infection of non toxic and non deadly bacteria one should allow the natural process of infection to take place but it doesn't mean that some amount of medication should not be taken some amount of medication is necessary to assist the person to support his system initial symptoms when a person gets infected by a bacteria or a virus is fever and why that fever comes i'll tell you later when i'm going to talk about the macrophage response the fever comes because of one of the cytokines that is il6 interleukin 6 is going to be secreted and that interleukin 6 when it makes its presence it is going to affect the hypothalamus and hypothalamus is our temperature regulator there it affects the hypothalamus therefore we lose control of regulating our body temperature we develop the temperature temperature or fever development is a good sign of acquired immune response but one should control the temperature that's all that is by administering the 
agents which are antipyretic antipyretic means the drugs which reduce the temperature and do not allow the temperature to shoot beyond 101 degrees fahrenheit and damage the brain so one has to protect the brain if the brain gets damaged person may lose memory and all other abilities that is why one should protect using antipyretic agent but generally people have the habit moment the infection takes place take antibiotics start from the first day itself which is not right antibiotics should be taken after 24 hours or 48 hours you must give a chance for your immune response to respond you take only the antipyretic agents antibiotics will prevent protein synthesis remember antibodies are proteins and if the protein synthesis is stopped you do not get proper acquired immune response and if you don't get proper acquired immune response you have a chance of getting infected by the same pathogen repeatedly therefore it is necessary for a person to allow the immune response to respond properly by using the medicines in regulated manner not abuse the medicines and allow the immune response to take place properly and this immune response that develops against the majority of the bacteria and virus it is only you can count on your fingers very few viruses and very few bacteria are deadly as long as you are protected against them through vaccination you don't have to fear about other bacteria because all other bacteria do not cause mortality neither other viruses cause mortality you have to allow your body to develop the immune response and this immune response is lifelong why because it is going to activate the t lymphocytes it is going to activate the b lymphocytes and both t and b lymphocytes that are developed against that particular pathogen will be stored in your bone marrow as memory cells memory t cells and memory b cells after the first infection once you have recovered that is after 15 days there is going to be immune memory and that is stored in your bone marrow remember this memory is different from the memory that you store in your brain here the memory we are talking about in the form of the activated t lymphocytes and b lymphocytes against that antigen which know now that antigen what kind of an antigen it is suppose by any chance you get infected by the same pathogen next time your immune response does not take such a long time you will respond to it so immediately because the immune memory cells the t cells and b cells respond within 48 hours and you get protection and that is why acquired immune response which is developed naturally is going to be supporting you lifelong with full immune response as long as your bone marrow is not damaged and i had already referred that bone marrow can damage get, get can get damaged because of the radiation treatment or chemotherapeutic agents that are used during cancer treatment that is why cancer patients are very vulnerable for all kinds of natural infections because they have lost their bone marrow and the immune memory cells are not working in them because they are dead therefore they need passive support of immune system and that passive support is called as artificially acquired passive immunity and what is this artificially acquired passive immunity once again this immunity does not give you lifelong support it is only for immediate protection and all pathogenic bacteria which are deadly against which you are already immunized but no doctor takes a chance that to wait for your acquired immune response to respond they will give the passive immunity when 
you are injured for example when you get injured you get wound and there is every chance that you may get tetanus for that doctor will administer the immunoglobulin g igg produced in other individual which is stored in the vial in the form of a strong highly concentrated dose of igg molecule and that is given to you through intravenous route immediately to give you protection so when that antibody is given to you that antibody will be in circulation now coming to the point of the plasma therapy here remember nowadays the buzzword is plasma therapy for coronavirus that is going on people who have recovered from the infection of coronavirus can donate plasma and that plasma is going to be administered to the people who are having severe symptoms to relieve the symptoms in them that is also passive immune therapy in the sense the person who had gone through the coronavirus infection will have developed the antibodies against all the antigens of the coronavirus and those antibodies will be present in his plasma or her plasma and when that plasma is transferred through the intravenous route to the person who requires it who is having severe symptom the antibodies present in the plasma of the donor will protect the recipient and the recipient gets the immunity passively and it is a temporary relief for the person so earlier earlier against diphtheria against tetanus the antibodies used to be developed in the horse and horse antibody against diphtheria and tetanus used to be administered to the human beings and that would cause real severe reactions because horse igg molecule antibody is quite different from human igg later the who came out with a resolution that if there are voluntary human beings available who can be maintained a healthy life by giving them some monetary benefit they are called as voluntary blood donors the volunteer themselves and they are immunized in the sense they are given the dead preparation of diphtheria dead preparation of measles dead preparation of tetanus we'll talk about that later what is this dead preparation the killed bacterial preparation or virus is administered to them okay nowadays there are active viruses attenuated viruses they can be also administered we'll talk about that later little later volunteers volunteer to give their body to develop immunoglobulins and they are paid on monthly basis and once in two months they are bled their blood is taken and from the blood the antibody is extracted and that antibody is extracted using uh, the the plasma is extracted from the plasma antibody is extracted by ammonium sulfate respiration but when you extract the plasma from the rbc you can suspend the rbc's back in saline and give it back to the person who donated the blood he will not lose the rbc's it's only that he will lose the plasma and that plasma will contain good amount of immunoglobulins large quantities of immunoglobulins and you can respirate them out using ammonium sulfate respiration method and once you respirate out the immunoglobulins under uh, a septic condition those immunoglobulins are passed through the millipore filter and then under septic condition they are wired and suspended in buffer and they are available in the market in the form of name ending with glob g l o b glob g l o b so it is available as diphtheria glob that is antibody against diphtheria it is available as tetanus glob tet glob similarly against different bacteria like pseudo glob against pseudomonas bacteria available then staph glob against staphylococcus similarly it is available against salmonella as immunoglobulin 
So these immunoglobulins, which are readily available in the market, they need to be stored in the fridge. And whenever necessary for an individual for the immediate protection, they can be administered through the plasma, sorry, through the blood vessel, intravenous route. Immediate protection the person gets. And at present, lot of pooled immunoglobulin. What is this pooled immunoglobulin? Pooled immunoglobulin is nothing but you have about 10, 15 professional blood donors. And those 10, 15 professional blood donors have volunteered themselves to immunize themselves against a particular deadly bacteria. They are volunteered. And they develop immunoglobulins. All their plasma will be pooled together and pooled plasma from which the antibody is extracted. And that antibody is called as pooled immunoglobulin. Nowadays, you get pooled immunoglobulins, human immunoglobulins, and no individual develops adverse reaction against human immunoglobulin. Why? Because human body, human body does not respond to another human's immunoglobulin. It will be received passively without any reaction. Under very rare some circumstances, the FC region of the antibody can become antigenic, which is very, very rare. That is 0.1%. Other than that, human immunoglobulin doesn't become antigenic to any other human being. Whereas the antibody produced against the, these deadly bacteria or viruses in horse, and when that immunoglobulin is administered to the human being, that antibody of the horse origin becomes antigen to the human being. So human being develops adverse reaction. So that practice is very, very rare nowadays against the pathogenic organisms, except, except against the snake venom. I had already mentioned that the snake venom is so deadly that human being cannot develop the antibody. Therefore, the snake venom, which is given in small quantities to the horse, horse will develop the antibody, and that antibody in the form of antivenom is administered to the person who was bitten by snake. It could be against one snake species. There are four common snakes in India where human beings encounter, like cobra, crate, viper. Okay, Co cobra, crate, viper. That is Russell's viper, and the another species is pit viper. And four different species are highly poisonous and they cause mortality in human beings. So, if you develop an antivenom against one snake species like cobra or the viper, it is called as monovalent antivenom. But sometimes, the venom of four different species are mixed together and horse is immunized. And that horse will develop antibodies against all these four species of snakes and that is called as polyvalent. And when a patient goes to the hospital, the victim who is bitten by snake and goes to the hospital and complains that he was bitten by a snake but was unable to identify which snake species bit him. The doctor doesn't take risk. He won't take the risk because it could be any of the four. So he will administer polyvalent antivenom. But if the person has identified the snake and says that I was bitten by cobra, then the doctor will administer monovalent antivenom. So depending on the patient's response, the doctor takes necessary measures and there is no other alternative other than administering these antivenoms. But remember one thing, large quantity of this antivenom sometimes need to be administered to save the person. Sometimes it may run up to 10 vials, 10 vials. And when it runs up to 10 vials, you know that how much of horse antibody has been pumped into the person was a victim and he will the he or she will develop the antibodies against that horse antibody and get sensitized and that will result in development of hypersensitivity anaphylactic shock and sometimes the persons who are administered 
the horse antivenom die of anaphylactic shock cardiac arrest rather than dying by the venom poison mm -hmm. and one one advice if a person gets bitten by a snake he may get protected by the anti venom of the horse origin but next within one year's time he should not be bitten by the snake once again if he is bitten by the snake once again he will have developed acquired immunity against the horse protein and then once again when the horse protein is going to be administered to him as immunoglobulin he will die immediately without responding to the anti venom that is the severity of the hypersensitive reaction so therefore it is advised that not to take anti venom repeatedly it is safe to remain safe distance from the snake species and take care of avoiding snakes rather than play with poisonous snakes so as far as the passive immunity is concerned it is only against horse anti venom and plus there is one black widow spider and the black widow spider is very common in certain countries like australia and other countries and this spider is deadly it has got two stings which are present near its mouth and out of defense it stings the person and the person may die because of the poison that is injected by the black widow spider the name it gets widow spider because this black widow spider is a female and it remains widow all throughout its life but it is uh, it mates with the male but kills the male after mating so it is so deadly uh, spider that <clears throat> it is uh, capable of killing uh, individuals it is found in swimming pools and when the individual goes unaware into the swimming pool and at the bottom of the swimming pool he puts his foot down and at the bottom suppose if the spider is lurking there it will bite the person and the anti venom is developed against that also now and there are now anti venoms developed against the scorpion there are people who are sensitive to scorpion bite also they may die sometimes so against different species of scorpion the people are developing anti venom that is once again the venom of these that spider or scorpion is given as an injection to the horse and the horse will develop the anti body and human being will not develop why because when you give a small quantity of the venom of this black widow spider into the human being not large quantity small quantity so much of burning sensation and nerve paralysis takes place same thing happens with the scorpion venom therefore it is not risked to develop the antibodies against these two species like scorpion and the spider in human beings okay till date till date nobody has developed the monoclonal antibody against the snake venom or the black widow spider or the scorpion venom and that is the breath taking or it will be a revolution if somebody develops monoclonal antibody against these venom then it will be more safer without adverse reaction because monoclonal antibodies can be produced through human cells and the human myeloma cells can be used for the development of monoclonal antibodies okay so i hope you have understood now about the plasma therapy plasma therapy is nothing but large quantity of the antibody that is present in the person who has recovered from the disease is given to the other person to relieve him from the disease symptom why because that plasma will contain the antibody against that pathogen okay and there will be no adverse reaction so as far as passive immunity is concerned remember that it is not going to last long it is meant only for immediate protection to save the person from death that's all then comes the artificially acquired active immunity and what is this artificially acquired active immunity all of us go through this it is a must it is compulsory if one doesn't go through this artificially acquired active immunity it is foolishness on the part of the person 
and ignorance on the part of the person. One should get vaccinated against the deadly bacteria, deadly viruses. Now you know that they are trying to develop vaccine against the coronavirus. And it is a must to save the lives of the individuals. We don't know when this pandemic is going to end and when this pandemic is going to repeat and when new other pandemics are going to come. So one has to be guarded against such type of pandemics. Okay. Earlier, you might have heard about in 18th century and be, uh, beginning of 19th century, plague was a pandemic and against which the vaccine was prepared later and the people were immunized. You know, smallpox was a pandemic. Now, smallpox is eradicated completely from the world. There is no smallpox in the world. All of us are immune against it. We have developed immunity against it. But we are immunized against smallpox. Okay. And the process of immunization against the deadly bacteria and deadly viruses using the killed preparation of those bacteria or viruses or active preparation, genetically modified preparations of those bacteria and viruses is called as vaccination. Vaccination goes through a schedule. There is a time limit for it. At a particular age, the vaccination has to be done. Okay. And the vaccine that is done where the bacteria or virus can be killed using heat, very high heat or by chemical means. Generally, the chemical that is used for killing the bacteria and viruses is nothing but formaldehyde or it is a phenolic emulsion. Very low concentration formaldehyde, that is 0.05% or 0.05% phenol, kills the bacteria and virus. And once this bacteria and virus is killed, you can administer this by diluting that formaldehyde or phenol in a suitable buffer. And when it is administered, the killed preparation of bacteria or virus will develop the immune response in the person where that will act as an antigen, particulate antigen, and the person develops both cellular and humoral immune response, and that immune response will be lifelong. Okay, so there are preparations like killed preparations of typhoid, cholera, and pertussis. Pertussis is another type of cough. Cholera and typhoid, all these pertussis, cholera, typhoid, all these are caused by the bacteria. And the killed preparation of vaccines of these are available. And they can be administered to the person at a particular age. We'll talk about that a little later. Then you know you are immunized against polio. But what you are immunized against polio now is a live attenuated vaccine. When we were children, we were immunized with SARC vaccine. SARC vaccine is the killed preparation of the vaccine. But still, we have immunity against it now, which we had developed during our childhood. And the SARC vaccine is the dead preparation of polio virus. Similarly, the hepatitis B virus, which causes hepatitis jaundice, their dead preparation of the virus is available as vaccine. Similarly, against rabies as well as influenza. Now, you know that there are vaccines being developed for coronavirus by Serum Institute of India in collaboration with the Oxford University, okay, AstraZeneca and the Bharat Biotech. Okay, both these are developing the vaccines against corona. And you won't believe there are about 150 vaccine candidates means 150 different types of vaccines being attempted all over the world against coronavirus at the moment. Okay, so those vaccines belong to the killed vaccine preparation as well as subunit vaccine preparation. Now let us talk about vaccines from whole organisms. Previous one also is whole organisms. That is bacteria and virus, you have used the whole organism, but it is the killed preparation. Now, there are live vaccines. Live vaccine means the vaccine that is preparing the bacteria is alive. 
or the virus is alive but it doesn't cause the disease how a live the viral preparation or live bacterial preparation can be given as a vaccine that is a wonder and this began in the year 18th century itself in 1808 itself the bcg vaccine bacillus that is bacille kelmet gurin kelmet and gurin are the names of two scientists french scientists who developed vaccine against the tuberculosis bacteria in short form it is called as bcg the sabin vaccine which is a live polio vaccine okay sabin previous one was sark sark is the dead preparation of polio virus sabin is live vaccine which you all are immunized it is developed in 1980s measles vaccine once again live vaccine is given typhoid vaccine once again live vaccine is given about live attenuated vaccines we'll discuss tomorrow 